I don't know how many people were kidnapped in 1968, but I was one of them. Albert Leppard and John Parker kidnapped me in the summer, and I thought I would die. My name is Lovejoy Butler, and I wrote Crooked Snake, The Life and Crimes of Albert Leppard. The bizarre kidnapping has stuck in Lovejoy Butler's memory for over five decades. In 1968, we had a farm north of Grenada, Mississippi, and I was down in the field plowing that day. I saw two men, two white men, coming down our field road. The small red-headed fella did all the talking. Hey man, how you doing? And, you know, being overly friendly. I was a little wary from the very start and they wanted a ride to Grenada. They said they had been walking all day. I initially said I had to work. I couldn't just give them a ride to Grenada. They kept on and they wanted a drink of water. I gave them a drink of water. I just had a sense that if I didn't give them a ride, they would be trouble. And so I agreed. I thought, well, I'll just drop them off at the edge of the town and they'll be somebody else's problem. I told them to get in, I would give them a ride. I'd pull down the, the field road, maybe 50, 75 feet, when there was movement to my right side, and the red-headed fella stuck a revolver in my ribs and said they were escaped convicts to stop the truck and get out. Well, of course, I naturally considered and thought that they were getting ready to kill me. And you can imagine how frightening that would be if you put yourself in that situation. But they didn't. They told me to get it back in and get in the center, which I did. And the fellow who had never spoken came around and started driving. They asked me where the nearest state line was. And I said 100 miles north to Tennessee. So here we go. We turned north on Highway 51. My mind was racing. The fellow who I didn't know who he was, Albert Leppard, still had the pistol on me. He was sitting on the right shotgun side. I was considering maybe trying to grab his arm and grab the pistol and we would wrestle, but I was a little bigger than him and maybe I could get the door open and we'd fall out of the truck and that kind of thing. I'm glad I didn't do anything because later knowing these fellows and who they were, they would have made very quick work of me. They did pull into our little country store out there, a place called Giesland's Corner. I asked them what they were getting ready to do, and they said they were gonna rob this store. I said, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. Look, I've got money, there's money in the pocket of the truck, you can have my money, which I had about $30, and in 1968, that was a pretty good little bit of money. We pull on out, they get uh, gas at a station on down the road, a truck you know, had been sitting on empty. We're on Interstate 55, headed for Memphis. Uh, no one knew where I was. I figured at some point I better try to talk to these fellows and figure my way out, because I didn't know what was gonna happen in the next five minutes. I asked the guy driving what he was in parchment for, and he said, armed robbery. And I asked the red-headed fella, and he said, murder. I didn't ask too many more questions then. <laughs> Got kind of quiet. At some point, he asked me, what do y'all grow on that farm? And I, you know, I said, soybeans, cotton. Oh, I know all about that. I know all about that. Still trying to be friendly. So as we were reaching the Tennessee state line, they told me there would probably be roadblocks on the state line if any shooting broke out to get on the floorboard. I said, look, uh, before any shooting breaks out, if you'll just let me out on the side of the interstate right here, I promise I'll just find my way back to Grenada. I'll get on my track. I won't say a word to anybody. But the next thing we knew, we were in Memphis. They pulled over on a street there in Memphis. They both got out of the truck. They both turned and walked away. And I could see them disappearing in the, you know, the rearview mirror. 
So I pulled him to an SO station, told the man what had happened, the attendant, he called the police. So I went on down to police headquarters. In the meanwhile, they picked up Albert Leppard and John Parker at the Adler Hotel right on the Mississippi River, a little low rent place there. And I picked them out of a lineup. I had to give a deposition to the FBI because they had crossed state lines with me that brought in the FBI kidnapping charges. The officers asked me if I knew anybody in Memphis and I told them my aunt and uncle were there. You know, they called them and my aunt, Addie brought a big piece of German chocolate cake down for me. And so it all kind of came to an end. Next morning, the sheriff came out to the house and uh, talked to my dad and uh, told him that uh, this man, Albert Leppard, was crazy. I was very, very lucky. Albert Leppard was born into a poor sharecropping family in a region of Mississippi, central Mississippi, in the Sineash Valley. They were all illiterate. It was a crime-ridden area of Mississippi because of the poverty. Albert committed a murder in 1959 of his great aunt. And in the process, he tied her up, set her on fire, burned her up. It was a torch murder. And of course he was caught, he and his cousin, and they were sentenced to life in Parchman. Parchman is in the Mississippi State Penitentiary. Years later, Boatler learned more about his kidnapper. Albert Leppard was a very likable person. Convicts would tell me that if Albert told you something, you could bank on it. It was the truth. He was very truthful. He had a winning personality, and his relatives would say that. He was always singing as a child. He was a real hard worker, and then he just got into that bad trouble. He was a small guy, but everyone I talked to uniformly would say he was really the toughest man they ever met in their life. Leopard escaped from prison six times. He was on the lam in southern Mississippi when he met his end in 1973. One night, he went into the Shaw's store, their little country store, and they were just about to close up. Pulled a pistol, said, this is a GD robbery, you know, give me all your money. Well, her husband, he kept a 20-gauge uh, shotgun above the door. He heard what was going on. So Clifton quietly took the 20 gauge down. The door was cracked a little bit, brought the 20 gauge up, got a bead on Leopard. But Leopard saw it. And Leopard got off the first shot with his pistol and hit the door frame right by Clifton's head and splintered and then shot again. And Clifton later said that it was so close to his ear he felt the wind off that bullet. And then Clifton shot and caught Leopard in his uh, arm and nearly blew his arm off. The impact took him backwards to the floor and he was cussing. The gun spun away from him on the floor and Leopard started crawling for the gun. Clifton came out and said, uh, don't go for it, I'll kill you. And of course, Leopard reached and grabbed the gun and rolled over and Clifton shot him in the chest from about eight feet away. And of course, that ended it right there. It was all over. Boatler says there's one thing about his run-in with Leopard that still puzzles him. About three weeks later, I was cleaning the truck up and I cleaned the pocket out. I found two 1922 silver dollars in there that apparently Albert Leopard had put in there for me for some reason. I've never quite figured that out. This is Inside Edition Digital.